Yeah, hi. Uh, welcome again to our ongoing discussion on uh, narrative techniques in fiction and as I said these are tools of the trade. So, of course, the uh, express concern behind these classes is to uh, acquaint you with uh, some of these techniques that uh, you can spot in the novels you read, of course, that is the express concern. But uh, if there is any ulterior motive for these classes, of course, in a very positive sense, if uh, tomorrow any of you wish to pick up your pen and start writing the novels, then at least a cursory understanding of these techniques uh, should help you. In, in fact, they should uh, you know give you a kind of kick start uh, you know to start your own novels that is uh, always uh, you know uh, I would like to think big on all your behalf you know I am more ambitious for all of you. So, I am sure these techniques that you are going to pick up in these classes might definitely help you. Uh, if not in writing novels, at least in your term papers, at least in your office reports that you oh, plan to write or in uh, you know any of the things that you write, they might help you in extraordinary ways, you do not know when they help you. Okay? Yeah. Let us continue our discussion of uh, these narrative techniques, we are in lecture 37. Now, I have a very interesting uh, uh, paragraph or a passage here. Uh, like we have been doing, you please read this and see if you can spot anything unusual here or if you can even uh, you know detect uh, a technique, if not the exact word at least if you can uh, find out what is happening here, you have uh, you know uh, uh, that is something remarkable. In his right waistcoat pocket, we found a prodigious bundle of white thin substances folded one over another about the bigness of three men tied with a strong cable and marked with black figures, which we humbly conceive to be writings, every letter almost half as large as the palm of our hands. In the left there was a sort of engine from the back of which were extended twenty long poles resembling the palisados before your majesty's court, where, wherewith we conjecture the man mountain combs his head. For we did not always trouble him with questions, because we found it a great difficulty to make him understand us. This is again from Jonathan Swift, Gulliver's Travels, Jonathan Swift, uh, one of the early uh, uh, practitioners of the novel of uh, uh, I mean the genre of uh, novel and therefore becomes a very important figure uh, figure for us even historically. Of course, his novels are remarkable even to this day we read them and uh, Gulliver's Travels, this is from Gulliver's Travels. Now, do you think I mean can you spot uh, what are these objects that uh, you know obviously, this is an encounter Gulliver's Travels please think of it how Gulliver especially in this context Gulliver travels and reaches uh, you know uh, the shore and then to his utter dismay he finds people these are called Lilliputans you know very tiny ones. So, something like each of them may be about uh, let us say about 10 inches or 15 inches something like that very small Lilliputan uh, the creatures. So, when they are trying to search this uh, person, in fact, for them the normal human being like you and me is a giant, because you know. So, 10 of them or 20 of them have to be put together in order to uh, make them look as tall as us, right or much more than that. So, for us, I mean for them uh, this guy is like a, a huge uh, giant. So, when they try to search him, they find in, in his uh, right pocket or waist pocket a book. So, that is something that they they are not very familiar with you know in that culture they are not very familiar with it that is a look look how they describe it. All that they are describing in this uh, passage they are describing two things one is a book a pocket notebook probably that he has and the other one is a comb that he uses in fact combing the hair look how they describe these things you know as if uh, we found a prodigious bundle of white thin substances fold, folded one over another 
about the bigness of three men tied with a strong cable and marked with black figures. And each letter is as big as uh, you know a palm or much more than that you know. Uh, every letter almost half as large as the palm of our hands. Obviously, it looks quite strange to them. What is ordinary for us a book or a pocket book look how these characters are describing and there is another one you know. Uh, then in the in the left there was a sort of engine from the back of which were extended 20 long poles resembling you know palisados before your majesty's court wherewith we conjecture that you know the man mountain combs his head he combs his head using this look how a comb is described. So, using unfamiliar words unfamiliar language in fact the purpose here is of course to create some kind of a distance between what we know as pocket book and what these guys the Lilliputans discover as pocket book. This technique is called defamiliarization. This technique is called defamiliarization. Uh, as a literary technique of course, this name uh, though uh, uh, Jonathan Swift wrote that uh, uh, you know much earlier. Uh, it was in the 1920s and the 30s that the Russian formalist critic Viktor Shlovosky calls this technique uh, defamiliarization. So, you cannot say that the invention the technique was invented in the 19th century it got its name in the 1920s that is all right it got its name in the 1920s and 30s otherwise this technique has been used in literature since time uh, immemorial. And in fact, uh, one of the formalist critics goes on to say that the very purpose of literature and art is to defamiliarize you know. So, what does defamiliarization mean? It simply means to make the familiar things look unfamiliar. What is the purpose behind that? Because most of the times we take things for granted. In fact, for us the moment we say a book we do not even scratch our head and try to think what it is because we have taken book for granted because we have been uh, you know in touch with book for quite some time. So, in order for the writer to create some kind of distance between what you already know as book and what these Lilliputans are discovering as book you know the writer uses uh, different language, different phrases, you know, different metaphors, different symbols, so that even an ordinary substance like a pocket book or even a comb looks and sounds something strange to us. So, we are made to look at this object, we are made to look at these objects from a fresh perspective. That is the reason why one of the well known uh, formalist critics says that. Uh, the objective of all art and literature is to help us look at things from a fresh perspective. So, in that sense entire literature all art is a defamiliarized uh, event you know it is a defamiliarized phenomenon right. So, and as I said uh, one of the reasons behind why writers use this technique is to destabilize, destabilize destabilize what we already know that is the reason why uh, you know defamiliarization. So, it, it happens using uh, uh, different uh, vocabulary different choice of words different descriptions for the known things and uh, so that is defamiliarization for us. In fact, uh, uh, similarly you find a parallel to this uh, when Bertrand Brecht of course, we discuss Brecht in a uh, in an exhaustive way or in a little more detailed way when uh, in subsequent uh, weeks especially when we come to discuss uh, drama and theatre ok. So, if there is a kind of an equivalent in, in drama for defamiliarization it is alienation effect. For Bertrand Brecht believed that you know his theater was meant to create alienate the audience from what they already know, so that they can look at things from a, a fresh perspective. So, so alienation effect is a, a dramatic counterpart of defamiliarization in the novel. Okay, I am sure you found that uh, very interesting. Now, as an activity, what you can do. Uh, see if you can describe tree from a fresh perspective using uh, different set of words or a child or any object maybe a chair maybe a table that you you know uh, keep your books on and write see if you can try to describe it in a in a different way you know and see the impact it creates 
when you read it ok that is something that you can begin doing right. Yeah. So, from defamiliarization let us go to multiperspectivity. Uh, in order to better understand this particular technique rather than a passage I have given you here, I have given here a cartoon you know. Now, look at this in the cartoon uh, just above me. Uh, there is a guy in the first picture when I mean in the guy who shouts boat, he has been stranded in the so called uh, tiny island, I do not know whether you can call that an island, a patch of uh, land uh, mass floating somewhere in, in you know amidst water. So, he says boat because for him boat becomes a, a symbol of uh, you know uh, uh, a lifeboat, it, the boat becomes a lifeboat for him you know it, it becomes a symbol of uh, hope because he has been stranded here. Whereas, for the other guy now look at it the other guy who is in the boat you know when he looks at uh, that small patch of land, land mass floating in the water he finds it you know land he exclaims it as land you know how it is about perspective right it is about uh, perspective multi perspectivity is something similar. So, here the writer presents a particular fact or the writer presents uh, something from multiple perspectives. So, when a particular character if it is a character A when he or she watches it how do they find it and when character B watches it how does this character find the same thing in a different way and how does it happen when third character watches it and describes it you know. So, this becomes a very important thing and again uh, symbolically speaking entire literature does that you know because the very purpose of literature as we discussed right in our first week you know is to offer us fresh perspectives. So, that we can look at the world from a renewed interest, we can uh, re-engage our interest in life when we look at life through uh, the lens of literature. So, here a uh, writer uses it in fact describes something from multiple perspectives that is why it is called multiperspectivity or it is also called polyperspectivity, polyperspectivity, multiperspectivity they are same. Uh, and uh, in fact, in order to bring out different facets of the same character let us say for instance here is a protagonist and he has certain complex uh, characteristic traits. So, how does a friend of the protagonist describe the protagonist, how does the enemy of the protagonist describe the protagonist, how does an acquaintance of the protagonist describe the prota prota protagonist. So, all of them all these perspectives offer you know uh, they they, they complement uh, each other's perspective and together you know when we read their perspectives together you know we get a complete picture about uh, the character we are reading. So, uh, it is uh, I mean philosophically speaking it is related to a concept called perceptual relativism or perspectivism. So, that when we combine all our perspectives we would be able to club all of them together and then get a, a holistic perspective. Remember uh, we had uh, even uh, you know uh, narrated a story related to an elephant how somebody who touches the trunk of an ele elephant calls it a snake blind man you know uh, a group of blind men and elephant that story was called a group of blind men and elephant. A person who touches the trunk feels elephant is like a snake, somebody who touches the ear considers it is like a fan, somebody who touches uh, the tusk you know considers elephant to be like a spear, somebody who tuck, I mean who touches the trunk looks I mean considers elephant to be a wall, somebody who touches the tail considers it to be something else. And unless we club all these perspectives we would not be able to get a complete picture of uh, the elephant right. Similarly, multi, multi perspectivity helps us construct a complete picture. So, uh, Samuel Richardson in his uh, novel Clarissa offers uh, multi perspectivity. Uh, in, uh, in his remarkable work Ant Hills of Savannah you find uh, uh, the Chinua Achibe uh, employing this uh, particular strategy. So, these are various strategies of course, perspective has to do with eye that is the reason why you have an eye there, but instead of one eye it is multiplied by several eyes. So, that you get a picture of multi perspectivity ok. From multi perspectivity 
let us go to learn uh, another very interesting uh, uh, literary technique. So, here is a, a rhetoric question, a rhetorical question. What is common in Nelly of Wuthering Heights, Humbert Humbert of Lolita, Salim Sinai of Midnight's Children, Tony Webster of Sense of an Ending and Piper Tale of The Life of Pi. All of them are remarkable novels, you know, all of them be it Wuthering Heights, Lolita by Nabokov, Midnight's Children by Rushdie, Sense of an Ending, probably another Booker winner, Life of Pi 2, you know. What is common in all these characters? You know, I mean, if you have read them or watched the movies, do you think you can uh, find out what it is? Well, all of them are unreliable narrators. They are the protagonists, they narrate uh, events through them, the story is propelled, you know, the plot is furthered using those characters there. But when you come towards the end of the novel, you realize that all of them are unreliable narrators because you cannot rely on them. So, they say something and you tend to believe it. As a reader, you tend to believe it. Unfortunately, towards the end, you realize what you came to gather from those characters was not really true picture. You know, there was something more to it and therefore, you have been deceived in, 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 in trusting them. So, unreliable narrators are characters used in a novel and they most of the time they mislead the readers and this misleading it may be deliberate or because you know because of uh, the, the, the mental capabilities of the narrator they may not be able to offer us a perspective solid perspective that can lead us towards truth. Let us say for instance uh, uh, if it is a, a child narrator you know obviously, a child narrator, we, we may not be able to trust a child narrator, though throughout the novel we tend to look at things from a child narrator's point of view, because the child is not equipped to understand an adult world. So, whatever the child narrates, we may not be able to trust it, therefore, it becomes an essential tool. On the other hand, if there is a character who is uh, you know a con person, you know who is a con man or a con woman, who whose profession is to cheat as a character. Well, they deliberately they cheat the reader as well, so that they want to project themselves as you know all good, all wonderful and things like that. But only when they are caught we realize that you know we were we were trapped in their narrative and that is the reason why uh, you know something like that. So, if you can recall even there is an extraordinary movie, The Usual Suspects, you know if you watch that mo movie you understand what we mean by the. Uh, unreliable narrators, you cannot trust these narrators or if there is a character who is mentally challenged, obviously their perception of reality is different, but until you know that they are mentally challenged, you tend to believe everything they say, right. So, uh, you cannot rely on them, you know, for various reasons they hoodwink the readers and of course, uh, I mean this helps the novelist to further the plot in a particular direction. So, it is a a deliberate strategy that uh, writers employ it. So, their narrators cannot be trusted, that is why they are called unreliable narrators. Okay? And uh, this particular term is uh, by uh, the 1960s uh, critic uh, Wayne Booth, he uses this term for the first time in rhetoric fiction. Okay? The technique is old, but probably the term that we have given to this is a new one. Yeah. Now, continuing our discussion of similarity of the characters. Now, what is common in Harry Potter uh, of uh, Harry Potter series, Dr. Watson of Sherlock Holmes series and again Katniss, is, uh, Katniss in the Hunger Games series and Bella Swan in the Twilight series. In fact, all of them are uh, series, uh, book series and of course, uh, they have also been turned into wonderful uh, movies. So, if you have watched these movies or read the novels, can you can you spot the similarity across these characters? Harry Potter, Watson, Katniss and Bella Swan. Well, if you can spot it, then that means you have got the literary technique correctly. Okay? All of them are called an audience surrogate. These characters are called audience surrogate. Of course, it is a, a literary technique related to uh, an element of fiction called characters, right. We learnt uh, in the previous class, in one of our previous classes, we learnt uh, various elements of uh, uh, fiction. 
So, these uh, techniques are linked to some of the elements. So, there are some techniques which are related to the plot, there are some techniques that are related to the character, there are some techniques that are related to the style. So, this particular technique literary technique or fictional technique is linked to an element of fiction called characters. right? The first one was unreliable character, unreliable narrator, this one is called an audience surrogate. What do we mean by audience surrogate? Here one of the characters in, the, in that fictional work expresses questions, concerns, feelings, emotions to the audience in such a way that you know in fact these are my questions let us say for instance when uh, when harry asks very na naively what is uh, uh, what is uh, let us say how does uh, you know horcrux what do you mean by horcrux harry does not know it is not that harry does not know in fact harry represents when the word horcrux is used for the first time obviously as a reader you and i do not know what what a horcrux is right so instead of, we cannot ask that question. So, instead of us Harry on our behalf Harry asks another character who knows uh, knows it what a Harcrox is and that character explains to Harry what it is. So, in other words Harry raises the question that we ideally raise or in Deathly Hallows for instance Harry does not know what a Deathly Hallows is and then one of uh, Harry's friends has to explain what Deathly Hallows is. So, the questions and the doubts that we have as a reader you know these things are represented by a character that character asks our doubts asks our concerns and uh, expresses our sentiments and gets the answer so these are called audience surrogates so they do the job of an audience when they perform that particular trick that's why it's called an audience surrogate Generally, this uh, technique is used in science fiction and especially in detective fiction because here in order for the detective to explain on what basis he or she has solved the mystery, I mean those detectives need surrogate audience you know. So, the surrogate audience could be one of the assistants of the detective or it could be a confidante of the detective. So, it could be anybody right. So, uh, that is what is called an audience surrogate you know uh, this is something that we can keep in mind and this literary technique is uh, related to uh, character uh, the element in uh, fiction it is related to the element of uh, character ok. Yeah. Now, here is another beautiful literary technique that we are going to learn and this, ex this excerpt is from uh, Dostoevsky's not so well known work called The Gambler. Of course, when we say Dostoevsky you must have heard of the brother Karamzo or the idiot even uh, uh, more than that the crime and punishment I mean crime and punishment you must have heard of uh, these novels. The Gambler is not so very well known, but interesting nevertheless. Now, read this at length I return from two weeks leave of absence to in fact the novel begins like this. The novel begins in this way. At length I returned from two weeks leave of absence to find that my patrons had arrived three days ago in, in Rolatenburg. So, you do not know when the novel begins in this way, you do not know who is this I and why did he have to leave station and who are his patrons. Because generally speaking when you read a work of art especially drama or fiction a play or a fiction. It is uh, you know you, we have already I mean learnt the Freytag uh, pyramid you know there is an exposition some th things are explained in a proper way introduced if there is a backstory everything has been introduced and uh, you know the, the rising action there is a climax the falling action and then a resolution to the problem. So, here I mean when we open the first page this is how the novel begins you do not know what who is the character here, what is the background just abruptly in the middle. I received from them a welcome quite different to that which I had expected. The general eyed me coldly, who is this general and why does he eye him so coldly, greeted me in rather haughty fashion and dismissed me to pay my respects to his sister. It was clear that from somewhere money had been acquired. I thought I could even detect a certain shamefacedness in the general's glance. 
the novel begins in a very abrupt way. So, rather than a beginning introduction to the general which money they are talking about, why is there you know a lack of bonhomie between them something like this. Instead of all that we find uh, the novel beginning in a very abrupt way. This is called in medias res. In medias res in fact, if you can recall we began the last class in such an abrupt way and I said I would discuss that technique uh, subsequently and this is the technique. So, when a novelist begins abruptly that technique is called in medias res and as I said you know in the beginning of the last class I sounded quite uh, abrupt and I said you know when I sounded that way probably you must have felt you must have missed something or there must be an editing glitch or something like that right. Of course, this technique is used by a novelist or anybody who uses it to draw your attention. So, the moment the first page offers you a mystery you tend to solve it you want to see what you have missed right that is the technique that the writer uses. And in Latin in medias res means it begins in the middle in the middle of the plot in the middle of things it means in medias res in Latin means in the middle of things. So, here the usual the five stages in which the novel or the fiction is uh, uh, stretched and developed that we studied in Freytag model as it has been skipped for a uh, dramatic reason and uh, the novel begins somewhere in the middle abruptly. In fact, this technique is as old as uh, Homer you know because Homer uses this technique in his uh, uh, you know Odyssey. Uh, it begins with uh, the Odyssey does not begin uh, anywhere in fact, it begins with uh, uh, Ulysses uh, recounting what happened and all that you know. So, it is uh, as old as Homer and as opposed to in medias res we have a technique called ab ovo you know it is an opposite technique that means from the egg. So, that means our regular conventional novels when we read it they start from the beginning they are introduced they introduce us to a character the background the setting equations with other characters and all that it happens in a very progressive way right. So, that kind of a conventional traditional beginning is called ab ovo from the egg in Latin ab ovo means from the egg like from the beginning from the scratch. So, as opposed to that you have in medias res and uh, somewhere the uh, you know it begins in the middle abruptly ok. From here let us go to another uh, important uh, literary technique it is called a red herring again this technique is employed extensively in uh, suspense thrillers and detective fiction and all that. A red, uh, a red herring is generally a false clue or a smoke screen I mean what do we mean by that supposing you know throughout the narrative the narrative has been built in such a way that especially now think of a, a, a crime novel think of a detective fiction. So, throughout you know almost you know if the novel has 100 pages first 80 pages the novel almost goes on giving us hints that you know probably character A is the culprit he is the one who committed this murder he is the thief who has stolen uh, you know. Uh, Kohinoor diamond and things like that. Whereas, only in the last 10 pages we realize that that is not actually that is actually an innocent character and uh, you know you were misled there the real culprit is elsewhere right. So, it is it is called a misdirect it is called a misdirect. So, red herring means a misdirect uh, a writer deliberately uses uh, this technique. So, that he or she wants to draw our attention away from the real person away from the real event. So, that you know uh, when we are introduced to the real person or the real event the shock value is uh, is retained you know the dramatic uh, impact is retained. So, in order to create dramatic impact a writer makes use of red herring red, red herring is you know a technique whereby uh, readers attention is being diverted away from uh, the vital truth you know it is been diverted away from the vital truth like uh, when in Harry Potter because we have been discussing Harry Potter 
I mean, I discuss that, you know, because, you know, that's something that you may have read or even watched those uh, series of movies. That's the reason why I use it, okay. So, uh, almost, you know, for first uh, few books, we are made to believe that uh, Professor Snape is uh, one of the villains. Actually, it turns out later, maybe in uh, uh, after book four or five, uh, you know, that is one of the good guys there. But throughout the series, at least the first few books, we are made to believe that Professor Snape is one of the bad guys there. Whereas, it is only later that we come to know that he is one of the benefactors of Harry. Rather than uh, doing him harm, he does not even wish him harm. In fact, he is one of the uh, you know caretakers of Harry. You know. So, the novelist introduces this particular element of Professor Snape at the right stage, you know, in order to pique our curiosity and retain the element of suspense it has been used. So, some of the well known works are Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. Of course, we discussed this novel especially in the context of discussing uh, you know uh, types of fiction, you can recall that. So, these are some well known uh, works. Uh, yeah, let us from red herring, uh, let us go to learn uh, another very important uh, literary technique. It is called duas ex machina. Again, a Latin phrase duas ex machina. It means here, uh, it is a, it's, it's a literary technique related to plot, right like uh, and red herring too is a literary technique related to plot, like unreliable uh, narrator is a technique related to character. So, uh, this particular deus ex uh, machina is related to uh, plot. So, here when a problem has been there, you know for a long time there is uh, you know the novelist is unable to solve this problem, then all of a sudden you know. So, this problem solves automatically on its own, maybe there is a divine intervention. In fact, it is it means in Latin it means a divine intervention, a divine intervention. So, it is again this particular it, it is based on uh, you know theater. So, towards the end in fact, in a, if you have watched any uh, old uh, you know uh, or if you have watched any plays uh, kind of old plays you know then you realize that. Uh, God, wa a God, uh, the machine of the God was brought down from above, like uh, you know, as if to solve the problem. You may also find this device in movies, old movies, and all that. So, based on that, this particular technique. So, all of a sudden, with the divine intervention, the problem has been solved, something like that. So, well known example to this is uh, William Golding's The, you know, The Lord of Flies. So, here he makes use of it and even in the wonderful Wizard of Oz, the writer makes use of uh, this particular uh, uh, device, you know these are some things that we can keep in mind. We have one more and probably with that we can uh, wind up. Uh, this is called a shoulder angel, another literary technique. Well, of course, in traditional movies you may have seen if there are you know if the character is in a dilemma, if the character is unable to decide where to go, whether to go this side, whether to go here. You find you know two angels, one a good angel, another not so good angel or a bad angel, you know. So, they appear on both uh, sides of the shoulder and one uh, keeps uh, you know advising him to do good thing, the other keeps advising him to do bad things and finally, the character is in a fix what to do and how does he do. So, this is again a literary technique. In fact, in order to inform the, the reader of uh, the dual sides or the duality of uh, the decision involved or the duality of the plot there or to discuss the pros and cons of something, the novelist uh, makes use of uh, this particular technique called sh shoulder angel, you know shoulder angel. Uh, and of course, we have uh, Christopher Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, you know making use of uh, this particular uh, device in a very significant way, this particular uh, thing in a very significant way. Well, uh, do you think you can go for one more technique, another small one? Let us learn that and probably then we can wind up this class, ok. Yeah, uh, ok. This is uh, another very interesting one, this is called foreshadow. Uh, well, as the term suggests, uh, you know what happens. Again, this is a technique used in detective fictions, uh, thrillers, suspense thrillers, you know, and all that. Here, uh, this foreshadow is again a technique related to the plot. So, uh, uh, 
sometimes uh, what happens before uh, the actual event is uh, revealed or unfolded, characters keep on throwing hints about it, you know. Let us say for instance, uh, I mean if you, if I can give you an example. So, here are two characters uh, talking in the college, now it is a campus fiction, let us say it is a campus fiction and in the first hour of the class, they are, th these two characters are sitting and discussing, you know, oh you do not know what is going to happen tonight and the other character asks, what is going to happen? Oh, did not you hear it from her? No, I did not hear it from anybody. You do not know, you know, tonight just watch during dinner time, there is going to be such extraordinary fight, you cannot even imagine, you will never have seen it in your life. A fight during dinner, really? Between whom? You wait and watch. It is going to be very gory, macabre. The dialogue ends there. So, what the what is this character doing here? The character is foreshadowing another event which is about to happen maybe after a page, maybe after a chapter or maybe after another part. So, this is another way of building your curiosity, building your attention, making you sit up and see what is happening, what is going to happen, you know. It is to pique your interest and to build suspense, uh, the writer makes use of a, a technique called foreshadowing, okay, yeah. There are plenty of techniques like this, uh, hardly we have discussed uh, about uh, 15 or so or 20, not more than that maybe. But of course, uh, 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 there are as many as uh, writers are, you know, each writer can invent a technique. But these are some familiar ones, some predominant ones that you can uh, identify. And uh, as we have been saying it, uh, the purpose behind introducing all these uh, various facets of fiction, elements of fiction, types of fiction and now uh, uh, you know narrative techniques used in fiction is to equip your own understanding of fiction in uh, you know from multiple angles, from multiple perspectives. So, that you know when you pick up uh, a work of art, when you start reading a work of fiction, you would be able to understand it and appreciate it all the more and you would be able to relate to what is happening there and see if possible try to learn a couple of things from there and maybe you know apply it in our own life. I am sure you find all these things uh, very, very interesting, okay. So, now that we have explored fiction uh, uh, from all these perspectives beginning with uh, definition of fiction and defiance of those definition, defiance to those definitions, experimentations, various elements of fiction, you know and uh, types of fiction and now techniques of fiction. Now, let us go in the next class, straight away let us pick a novel, let us pick uh, you know at least a short novel, we have already announced it right in the last class. I said we would take up uh, uh, George Orwell's uh, animal form for discussion and see how what all we have learnt in these uh, classes, how many of them can we apply there and uh, you know let us discuss that novel, you know let us critically uh, explore that novel and learn to appreciate in a a little more refined way, okay. Uh, until then, take care. We will see you in the next class with Animal Form by George Orwell.